I'd like to welcome um, Mike Dwan, who's a journalist with the Limerick Leader for over 10 years now. Um, in that time, he's covered a lot of the major stories in Limerick and has broken a lot of stories as well. Um, he's going to talk to you today about um, his coverage of the uh, 2009 local elections and a story that he got from the then Minister for Defence, Willie O'Dea, um, who made allegations that uh, one of the other candidates, who was a Sinn Féin candidate, Boris Quindleman, was involved with the, uh, a brothel uh, in the city. Um, the story was called Brothel Gate, was it? Or it became known as the Willie O'Dea Affidavit story. Um, and it eventually led to Minister O'Dea resigning. I'm not going to give you the details of it. Mike is going to talk you through it. And he's going to talk in particular about the lessons he learned from it, about tape recorders. Yes and also about um, his work as a regional reporter and give you some tips on you know, how to succeed and how to make a mark and you know, advice for when you go out working at the end of the, of the semester. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Um, first off, sorry, sorry for being late. I, I, I was late to a lot of uh, seminars in the past myself, uh, but normally as a student, um, so I apologize for being a, a bit late here. When Mary first called me and said that she wanted me to do this, I, my first thoughts were somebody else had cancelled. Um, and then she said, well, we're doing this thing called Issues in New Issues in Journalism. Issues in Irish Media, yeah. Issues in Irish Media, and she mentioned, you know, you know, investigative journalism, and I have done some of that. But because of, I suppose, the retrenchment and cutbacks um, in, in the media, and that's national as well as regional, there's been less opportunity to do that. But I have done a few investigative stories. Um, yeah getting the chief executive of the port company to, uh, to resign when, when uh, we were able to reveal that there was these uh, contracts uh, put in place as a, as a means of uh, paying him money that was over and above uh, the, the government guidelines at the time. And I had used a lot of uh, investigative techniques in that, you know, using, you know, FOIs, FOIs and cultivating sources and getting my hands on confidential internal audits and also um, tearing the arse of my trousers, climbing over um, a fence in Kilrush Marina to get a picture of a boat. Um, so there was a lot of different techniques uh, involved in that. But that wasn't what Mary wanted me to talk to you about. Well, no, I wanted uh, you to talk about your investigative reporting. <laughs> but I think um, I would also like you to talk about, if you want to talk about some of the techniques you use in that, it would be very interesting. Not at all. And then maybe Willie O'D. You know, Willie O'D. is what everybody wants to know about. Yeah. Um, it was a milestone in my career, or a millstone, depending on uh, how you look at it. But it didn't involve any investigation whatsoever. Um, I'll start off by giving you some of the dramatist persona in this, uh, in this saga. Uh, one of them, the first, is, is a guy called Nessun Quinlevin. I don't know if anybody here knows of Nessun Quinlevin. He's from Ballinanti in Limerick City. He's a convicted IRA man. And in uh, 1991, he, he shot his way out of Brixton Prison, where he was uh, awaiting trial for um, an assassination a t a plot on a British industrialist called uh, Sir Charles Tilbury, who was a big supporter of Thatcher and the Tories at the time. And there was some IRA plot to apparently kill him. Nesson Quinlevin was arrested along with Pierce Macaulay, who many of you will be aware went on to be convicted of the manslaughter of Jerry McCabe and Adair some years later. These guys were in Brixton Prison and uh, they busted their way out of there with, uh, with a gun that had been uh, smuggled into the jail uh, in a shoe. Uh, and Nesson came back to Ireland. He was uh, jailed in 1993 here after he was caught with, uh, with weapons in, in Nina, and he was the subject of a big, long extradition case. Um, the British government wanted him extradited, but that didn't happen because he became a qualifying prisoner under the Good Friday Agreement uh, subsequently. Um, the other people, I suppose, in this story are uh, Willie O'Dea, uh, who, at the time our story begins, was the Minister for Defence. Morris Quinlan, Nesson's brother, who at the time was uh, running for uh, the local elections in Limerick City. Um, they didn't have a public representative in Limerick, Sinn Féin, at that time, um, but they do have now. Uh, now he's Councillor Morris Quinlan, some of you may know him. Uh, the other, uh, I suppose, uh, peripheral characters in this drama are Maria Garcia da Silva, Ana Cristina dos Santos, and Jocelyn Costas dos Santos, who were um, three Brazilian prostitutes who were uh, running a brothel in Clancy Strand. Uh, in 2008 when they were busted by Gardaí. Uh, these three women were uh, brought before the court, Limerick District Court, in January 2009. 
they were convicted. And it turned out that the apartment in <coughs> which they had been operating was owned by none other than Nesson Quindlevin. I, I don't know what uh, Nesson does now, but I, I know that at the time his job was, uh, of all things, making headstones. But he also uh, owned a, a property in Clancy Strand where, they, where these women were found. Uh, but there was never any suggestion that he had any idea what they were getting up to, or you know that he was in any way involved uh, in this business uh, at his apartment. And there was uh, certainly no suggestion that his brother Morris, who you remember, was running for election, uh, was involved in, in anything of the sort either. Um, so that court case was in January 2009. Uh, I knew nothing about it. I wasn't there. I was at a friend's wedding in New Zealand. So uh, I have no idea uh, when I went to the Fianna Fáil local election launch five years ago at the Clarion Hotel that uh, Willie O'Dea would introduce this matter uh, in a straightforward interview. Um, Willie had been there to give a, a pep talk. It was March 2009 and things had really hit the fan in terms of the uh, collapse of the economy here and Fianna Fáil was obviously going to be under an awful lot of pressure going into the campaign and that was something that the minister, as he was then, was reminding the candidates about. He was saying, you know, keep things local and don't get into the IMF or other stuff you probably don't know about uh, and, you know, keep talking about, you know, whatever it is, the, the potholes or all this local stuff. Um, so I'd been asked to go along. I'd been invited to go along. It was at the Clarion Hotel. It was, uh, it was a Monday night. And uh, I had two matters to ask Willie O'Dea about. Um, Willie, as you know, was uh, combative in uh, many ways. Um, he's, uh, you know, one of the dolls' uh, great wits, if you appreciate that style of humor. Uh, but he's also a, a street fighter in many ways. Um, he had been the subject of a, of a court case um, sometime previously, where there was a guy called Matt Larkin, uh, who was associated, I think, with uh, dissident Republicans. Um, he had been, he accused Willie O'Dea of assaulting him in a pub. And then the guards charged Matt Larkin with making a false allegation uh, of assault against Willie O'Dea. He, in turn, was acquitted. And Noreen Ryan, who was a Fianna Fáil candidate at that time, uh, and no great pal of Willie O'Dea's, was criticizing him for this. Uh, how come that this, your version of events wasn't, you know, uh, found to be the case by a judge? So I, did, I had planned to ask Willie about that. And I also had planned to ask him something <coughs> Morris Quinlevin had put out in a press statement earlier that day uh, to the effect that Willie was using his ministerial advisors to attend to constituency business. And he gave me a letter that was on the Department of Defence head of paper, and it was dealing with uh, a woman's planning application in, uh, in phone litigation. And basically, Morris's point, which was legitimate, uh, was that uh, the minister shouldn't be spending uh, you know, government resources dealing with constituency matters. So I had those two things to put to Willie O'Dea after I allowed him to say his piece on, on the local election candidates and uh, being a false prospects. Um, so one about Mark Larkin and the assault case I thought would be controversial, and the other one about the planning applications of Morris Quindlevin I thought would be less so, but it turned out to be the exact opposite. Um, he didn't want to talk about Matt Larkin or, or Noreen Ryan or the assault allegation in the pub. Uh, but he had, had no problem, uh, you know, countering Sinn Féin, and I think that uh, Willie O'Dea's animus towards Sinn Féin would be uh, pretty legend. Um, he would never lose an opportunity if Sinn Féin were criticizing the government on some economic policy to say, well, what, what do you expect from these guys, our daily guys that shot Jerry McKay? This kind of thing would, would always be Willie O'Dea's stock answer. And he wasn't the only one. Michael McDougall and, and people like that would always, uh, would always make the same point. Um, so it's like a red rag to a bull when uh, a Sinn Féin representative, uh, or was at that time, uh, criticized uh, Willie O'Dea. So I asked him about this, and I'm just going to read out what Willie O'Dea said. Some of you may have heard this already, I've no doubt if, if you look at YouTube. Um, Willie O'Dea said, they, Sinn Féin, they're running a big campaign. The money from the Northern Bank must be stretching fairly far. Quote me on that. And while occasionally we send out letters to planning applicants on the wrong kind of paper, we have never been involved with anyone who shot anybody, or robbed banks, or kidnapped people. And I suppose I'm going a bit far when I'd like to say this, but I'd like to ask Mr. Quinlevin, is the brothel still closed? I said, well, I said what, what brothel are you talking about? Remember, I was in New Zealand when this happened. I said, what brothel is that, Willie? Don't you know the brothel that they found in his name and in his brother's name down in Fancy Strand? I said, no, I'd never heard about that. I said, did you not hear that? 
you better check with your sources. This was a house owned by him that was rented out and they found two ladies of the night operating in there in the last couple of weeks, he said in the kind of the cryptic manner that, that Willie often uses. Um, so I hadn't expected this revelation. It was news to me and like I said, it was no a great feat of investigative journalism on my part. This just fell into my lap. It was all happily uh, volunteered by the minister and all into a tape recorder that I was holding onto that famed moustache at the time. Um, so I had to check it out. When Willie O'Dee said, and this became controversial later on, when he said to me, you better check with your sources. It was out of commentary later on, saying that, well, maybe Willie wasn't sure of his information. But I took it to mean, uh, you better check with your sources. Maybe you should get some better sources. Your sources are clearly aren't good enough. You're the only one in town who doesn't know this. And uh, so I did check it. And uh, I checked with the guard who was involved in the case. And he said, no, he, he, he was aware that Ness and Quinn owned the property, but Morris didn't have any interest in it. And I did check with uh, one of the dissident Republicans in town as well, who uh, obviously have no great uh, love for Sinn Féin or for Morris Quinlivan. And uh, Morris was saying later that dissident Republicans were involved in smearing him by putting this allegation around town. But my source in uh, the dissident Republican movement in Limerick wasn't able to confirm this information. So I went, I went back to the office uh, the following morning. And was, at that time, we used to have a deadline um, in the morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, for the Limerick Chronicle, and uh, I got into work at half past eight, and I said, what do you want me to do with this? They weren't too upset about it because they had a, a good story on um, on Christy King, the, the gangster, on, on, on page one. I don't know, the tabloids in the Limerick Leader are uh, exactly that. They, they tend to deal a bit more with you know, crime and that kind of stuff than, than the broadsheet is, which is supposed to be, a, in more theory, a more austere uh, um, publication, which, which it isn't really anymore. But uh, in any event, uh, they had a story about Christy Keane, I think, uh, uh, as the lead, and uh, they weren't too worried about it. Um, in any event, I was, at this, at this stage, I was coming around to the opinion that what William D had had to say about Morris Quinlivan in relation to his ownership interest in this apartment where the prostitutes had been found was probably not true. I rang Morris about it, he denied it, and uh, he said that uh, if Willie O'Dea says that, uh, that he was going to sue Willie O'Dea. He said that he had an ideological objection to accumulating property, that he only had one property, and he said he, the bank owned half of that, and it uh, was absolutely untrue what the minister had to say. And you would imagine then that is at that point that uh, <coughs> the story should stop because you have an uncorroborated allegation. And I went into the editor and I said, look, I don't, I don't think this thing stands up. But the editor was still interested in doing the story in any event on what he saw as a political smear by Willie O'Dea on an opponent, an on the record political smear by Willie O'Dea on the opponent. So I went back to Morris and I said, look, this is what the minister is saying. He's saying it on the record. And uh, I can print it and print your denial and your threat that you're going to take legal action. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that he was happy with that. And, uh, that's how the story was printed. Um, the first uh, paragraph, it began like this. Sinn Féin's Morris Quinlan says he's considering legal action against Willie O'Dea after the Minister for Defence claimed he part owned a Clancy Strand apartment where a brothel was discovered in the Garda raid. And that is the allegation in indirect speech um, in the first paragraph of the story. What I didn't mention, you know, Willie O'Dea's comments about ladies of the night, this apartment rented out, owned by him, the ladies of the night, that, that was not directly quoted, but that, and that became relevant uh, when Willie O'Dea went to uh, sign his uh, affidavit some months later. Um, so I suppose all politicians have an instinct for self-preservation, and when Willie O'Dea would have read that Morris Quinlivan was, was going to, uh, to sue him, I suppose his defense mechanisms would have, would have kicked in uh, at that stage, and he would have uh, started looking for okay, a way out of it. Uh, remember, there's a, there's a clear hostility and animosity between uh, Morris Quinlan and Willie O'Dea at the time, and uh, that endures. Um, Morris Quinlan did follow up his legal threat, and there was a lot of toing and froing ahead of a defamation case. And uh, in April, Willie went into uh, solicitors in Bletford Street, and he drew up an affidavit which, which he signed. And he said he categorically denied having said such things to me, i.e. the allegation of ownership of the apartment as it related to Morris Quinlan. Um, and uh, obviously you can remember as well that Willie O'Dea is actually a trained barrister. So yes, he would have... Yeah. Uh, He'd have understood. Yes, I yeah. think he lectured law. Did he, he lecture did. law here? Here he did, yeah. yeah. 
So he would have been uh, acutely aware of uh, the significance of, of what a sworn affidavit was, something that would be presented, you know, as gospel in front of a High Court judge. Um, Morris Quinlevin had sought an injunction against Willie. Remember, this was around April. Uh, the local election was in, was in May or June? May. Was in May. May. Late May. Um, so Morris was unelected at this stage, um, and what he, he sought an injunction to prevent what he saw as calumnies against him uh, being spread around town and repeated by Willie O'D. Uh, but he didn't get that injunction, incidentally. Um, he said partly on the strength of what the High Court judge accepted in Willie O'D's affidavit, that he, that he had never said these things in the first place. So he failed in that bid to get interlocutory relief, i.e. an injunction, to prevent uh, Willie saying these things. Yeah. Um, and in due course, there was going to be a more substantive high court defamation case to where Morris was going to take Willie to court over the substantive allegation. Um, so that was penciled in for after the election. And by that time, Morris Quinlan had had Ram Tone to victory. He was easily elected. And I think uh, he's acquitted himself really well in the council since. And I'd, I'd say he'll easily be elected later this year. Um, but that's beside the point. I've become aware of the affidavit, um, I can't remember if it was before or after the election, and I got sight of it, and I saw what the minister had sworn on this affidavit, so I knew that I had a problem now, potentially, that there was this defamation case coming up in which the minister was saying, basically, that I had printed something that he had not said. Um, so he was effectively accusing me of fabricating an allegation, um, and a lot of his affidavit said, Oh yeah, look, I said this thing about is the brothel still closed, but I never yeah, so said that he, that he owned it or anything like that. So basically he was saying that because his direct quote was not in the copy, he never said it at all. Uh, even though, as I say, in the first paragraph in indirect speech, the allegation of ownership was, was clearly there for all to see. So I, Willie, obviously, as a lawyer, can parse and analyze things in, in great detail. Uh, but he was kind of on the defensive here. Uh, but I, I would have thought any reading of that, yeah. uh, he could have got on the phone to me to clarify um, what he had said before he swore his affidavit, but he never did that. Um, so was he you know, hanging me out to dry? Was he aware that I had the whole thing um, on a tape? I, I can't know. Um, Willie himself said when it became a huge political controversy that he was acutely aware that he was being recorded. Um, but a lot of people didn't believe him, um, but the government at the time did, and, and defended him tooth and nail. Uh, but thankfully, that's, that's, that's the thing that I did have. I did have a tape recording of it, um, because if I didn't, it, it would have relied on, I would have had to rely on my note and uh, the word of a, you know, an obscure provincial journalist against the word of a minister of the government in a court case, potentially. It, you know, the odds are stacked in his favor there. So it was lucky for me, for the sake of my future employment, that I actually did have a tape and uh, that's what, what ultimately saved my job, I think. Um, Sinn Féin were also uh, looking um, for a discovery, and in the legal sense, demanding discovery of any notes or transcripts or recordings of uh, the conversation at this stage. And uh, when Alan English, my editor, came back from holidays, was it in June or July of that year, uh, he agreed that uh, a transcript should be released to both sides. And when Willie saw what he had done. He knew he was in trouble and he knew he had to reach a settlement and it was just before Christmas that a settlement had been reached. They never confirmed to me what the settlement was but I understand it was per about 100,000 euros that the minister had to pay to Morris Clinton and uh, shortly afterwards Sinn Féin were able to open a constituency office in Mary Street which I don't <laughs> think was a, a coincidence um, but in any event that's what I understand the amount was. Um, the Daily Mail had also got their hand on the transcript. It was the Mail on Sunday, in fact. They had also got their hand on the transcript, and they uh, splashed it all over the front page on Sunday. And it was something about OD misled High Court, was the big splash. It was a picture of Jedward eating cereal down the bottom of the page as well. Um, but I, I remember that and said, OK, this is going to get traction now, and it did. Uh, just before Christmas, there was a, a Fine Gael senator 
Eugene Regan. I don't know where he is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He kind of came on the scene and disappeared. Mm. Yeah. He was banging the drum in a big way, um, saying that Odie needs to explain himself and all the rest of it before and after Christmas. Uh, but it was really around February um, that it, it got real traction, and Eugene Regan was repeatedly banging the drum, as I say, on this in in, in the Shannon right through January, and basically accusing the minister of perjury and he mentioned the P word uh, in the upper house and as you're probably aware you have um, absolute privilege when you're in a, in the house of parliament <coughs> you can say anything you want about anybody and you say well, withdraw that remark you know well it's not true yeah. and yeah. There's, no, there's, you know, there's no you don't have to you can say anything you yeah. like on the doll because you're protected by privilege I wasn't but uh, Eugene Regan was and you know he was accusing Odi of perjury so it was uh, going to be a real problem for Brian Collin and his government at this stage, and, and then the Kenny then sought um, a yeah. motion of confidence, no confidence yeah. debate in the minister. He wanted to put down a motion of no confidence, but because the government had the majority at that time, which was slender, with the support of the Greens, Brian Collin turned the tables and said, no, instead we're going to have a motion of confidence in William D. proposed by me, the teacher of the land. And uh, that's what happened, I think, on, on February 17th, 2010, there was a, a motion of confidence debate, and all the other business of the doll was suspended for today. Big drama. It remember. was, yeah. yeah. It was an extraordinary day in the doll, actually. And uh, I think uh, William D. He, he thought by that stage that he, he was, was, right. was okay, he was, yeah. that there was no problem. He had the support of yeah. Brian Cowan, and he had the support of the Green Party, who, you know, were suppose, uh, supposedly the party with conscience in, in the coalition uh, arrangement at the time. Um, at one point, there was an intervention from Joan Burton, where she read out the transcript in a very dramatic fashion. And uh, Willie and Dermot O'Hearn and others were skidding over at the other side of the house. And clearly, they didn't feel they had you know, anything to worry about. But Joan Burton was saying that you know, the Limerick leader would do um, the public a great service if they released the tape. Remember, the transcript was public at this stage, but the tape wasn't. And uh, the tape, I think, when it was released the following day, was to prove uh, insignificant, or significant. Major significant, yeah. Uh, my sister, she called me from uh, Galway. She's a Green Party supporter. And uh, she was very upset with me that I had put Eamon Ryan through this terrible ordeal of having to defend Willie, Willie in the doll. And it was Eamon Ryan's worst ever doll performance, where you could see that he'd been told, OK, you're the guy who was to go out and bat for Willie and his heart wasn't in it. I like Evan Ryan, I think he's a, he's a conviction politician. You might agree with everything that he has to say, but at least you know, his convictions you know, are, seem to be important to him as much as political expediency. Yep. But he had a terrible trial uh, defending Willie uh, that day in the doll. But anyway, they won the confidence motion, and people thought that was where it would end. Maria. Then you had Dan Boyle's tweet yes. that evening. Dan Boyle was a senator. Green Party. S yeah. Green Party senator, chairman of the Green Party. So he wasn't participating in the Dáil confidence debate, but he was the chairman of the party as a senator. But well, he tweeted that night after the confidence motion was defeated, or passed rather, that, um, that that wasn't the end of the matter and he still had serious concerns about it. The following morning there was a story by a guy called Jimmy Wolf in the Irish Examiner who's been struggling to fill Mary's shoes for the last number of years now. Um, and there was a suggestions from political sources in Jimmy's story, I don't know who they were, that A, the tape had been destroyed by the Limerick leader at OD's request, or B, that we'd refused such a request. And my, and my editor had to go on Morning Ireland to say, look, this wasn't true. There was no such request. So there was pressure then from the political establishment, i.e. Joan Burton, who was one of the stars of the opposition, saying the leader should release the tape. And then the suggestion that we weren't releasing the tape to protect the minister, and we made the decision then that, okay, we will release the tape. And we did that um, on our website, I think at about 12.30. Yeah. Um, it was a Wednesday, was it? It was it Thursday. Was it? Yeah. it was Thursday. And so it was uh, available on our website. And basically, within five minutes, it had been ripped by every radio station in the country. And it was there for when Sean O'Rourke uh, was ready to yeah. grill Willie. Uh, at one o'clock on the news at one. Remember, Willie was, you know, uh, he was uh, pretty shaken up, but he was pretty confident that he was going to hold on to his job thanks to having won the confidence debate the night before. I'm sure he thought he was out the gap. I thought he was out the gap, yeah. Uh, but then this, this tape was released, and it was quite a dramatic opening to the news. <laughs> 
where the tape was played. And if you've heard the tape on YouTube, it does it does sound a bit seedy. I have to admit, you know. Um, so yeah, I think Sean O'Rourke said you're one dirty fighter. Where are you where are you coming with that? And, and, and Willie was defending himself, and he made some remark that I'm doing in all this, yeah. which was seems very damaging to him that he was kind of feeling sorry for himself. Um, he had also told the Greens, as far as I'm aware, and there's an account of this in Mary Minahan's uh, book on the Greens in government. I forget what the name of the book is. Yeah. Um, but there's an account of it where, where the, the, the Greens, John Gormley, had been told by Willie that, um, that I would be writing the story in the Limerick Leader that was due to appear the following day. We go to press on Wednesday night, or we did at that time, and the paper would be out on Thursday morning, and that I would give my version of events from start to finish, and it would corroborate his Please. version of events. So we had this crazy situation where on Thursday morning in Dublin, in Leinster House, the Greens were in Conclave and sent one of their staffers down to Eastonsville, Collins Street to play a copy of the Limit Leader of all things. Um, so they brought it back and it wasn't a proud moment for me because I, I, I had so much media, other media to do. I wrote this thing in an awful rush and it, was, it wasn't long winded particularly, but it was very yeah. long. Yeah. I think it necessarily had to be long and it wasn't particularly, you know, well written, but it, it didn't corroborate what, what Willie, Willie's version of events. I, I just told it as I had seen it. And apparently John Gormley and the rest of them weren't particularly impressed. Dan Boyle, even you know, the night before, had been obviously putting pressure on him. And uh, they would go to Taoiseach and uh, they said to uh, Brian Cohen that uh, they would pull out the government unless yes. Willie resigned. So it you know, could have potentially yes. brought down the government. But it didn't. Willie said for the for the good of the government and for the good of governance in the country, that this would be coming a distraction. And that evening, Thursday evening, he resigned, and Willie was done. So um, it's a it's a rare occurrence for a minister to resign. You, know, yep. you see them all the time in Westminster, but it's like a hen's tooth here. Uh, very rarely do you see a minister to resign. So it was a big big story, and uh, it was not only just a story about you know you know politics, you know, terrorists, prostitutes, you know, all the ingredients of the story there. But it also kind of became about media ethics as well. Yeah. And um, I found myself kind of in the uncomfortable position of being part of the story as much as yes. the yeah. person who broke it. And there were all kinds of questions about, uh, you know, was it ethically correct for me to release the tape, which I, which I only did after yeah. consultation with the editor. Um, uh, because if you if you do hear the tape, it does sound. I don't know if it's the nature of the tape when you hear the Anglo tapes, yeah. where you know they're regulatory obliged to yeah. to uh, to record these things. I don't know if John Bow and all the rest of them knew they were being recorded. recorded could, yes. But it does sound very seedy and shifty. And yeah, CD, it yeah. does. Yeah. 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 Um, in any event. Um, Tape like was you, had released. To, you had to release it. Really. I did, yeah. We came under incredible pressure to release it. Yeah. And uh, it's funny when people hear the spoken word. Like yeah. you can give as many transcripts, but when they actually heard him, I remember listening to that news at one on the, on the car, in the car, and like it was explosive stuff. Yeah, he was really gone after that. He hung himself free, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he was really gone after he that. He was gone after it. And do you want to maybe talk to them about the importance of having a backup tape and making sure that the tape works? Into an yeah, well, <laughs> this I, is probably the best example of it that I can quote for them. You know? Well, I lost, a, I lost an interview uh, only today because my battery is running out. Yeah. It's not anything as important as this. But you can take a note, um, and lawyers can parse it and dispute it yeah. and say, look, that's, that's not what I said. You know? If you have something, you know, it's a file, digital, and, and it's there, and there it's, it's just a great record to have. This wasn't the first time that Willie had accused me of misquoting him. There was, uh, a controversy over uh, CIA rendition flights through, uh, through Shannon <coughs> and the US ambassador at the time, was James Kenney I think it was, had assured <coughs> Bertie Ahern and Brian Cowan that this wasn't happening and then he spoke to some people working in Shannon who claimed to have seen a guy in manacles uh, on a plane when they went to clean it and uh, we were asking you know, about this and we had heard about it and said, well, you know, I'm not happy with those assurances. Maybe we need some more assurances. Um, so that's that's fine, you know. So I, I had him and said, you know, Willie O'Dea is, you know, at odds with Bertie Hearn and Brian Cowan over, you know, whether or not US diplomatic assurances should be accepted. 
And then he said, I think it was in the post the following week, that he had never said that at all to me. Yes. And so if I was to, he never asked for a correction or anything, which I thought was significant. But he, um, if he had, you know, challenged me on it and I had a note, um, I didn't have a tape recorder, it would have been uh, potentially difficult for me. So, um, and, and, and Willie had been caught up with a tape recorder before, famously, uh, when um, the government went to deregulate the taxi industry. I remember being a student in Dublin and waiting for two hours to get taxis home. Um, and then the government deregulated the taxi and brought more people in and you know made the uh, made licenses easier to apply for a transfer. And uh, taxi drivers who were on the gravy train and had a kind of a cartel running all around the country were very upset about this. And Willie, being a man of the people and a man of the taxi driver, went to this uh, meeting in Limerick saying that he absolutely opposed the government's policy of deregulation. And then he denied having said that later. And then somebody who had recorded it, played it, I think, on Morning Ireland. Tape, yeah. He was caught up with a tape before, you know? Yeah. So, uh, no more than the other politicians. They will try to, you know. Deny. Yeah. They yeah. will try to disassociate themselves very often. Uh, Willie's by no means the worst offender. Like, um, so, they will try and backtrack and, you know, weasel their way out of things that they've said. So, it's very important to. But have it's, a probably, record. it's probably one of the only stories that has brought a minister down. I can't think of any other one. Any yeah. other minister who's resigned. Well, yeah, I suppose. You know, if you think about it. Did Ray Burke resign? I think Ray Burke um, maybe resigned. Uh, he said it was health or something. Mm. But it was the whole tribunal, wasn't it? The yeah. mm. um, but that really Which wasn't. Which came from Sam Smith, really. It came from Sam Smith, yeah. yes, yeah. Mm. But uh, actually, a direct result of the story, you mm. know. This would have been, you know, one. Um, I just want to cut. Do you, is there anything else you want to say about that? Or will I the thing about it? ethics, right? And I think this is important. Like, um, Willie uh, was at the time also um, a columnist and still is in the Sunday Independent. And he resigned on Thursday. And by Sunday, <coughs> the Independent team writers had a good two days to, you know, launch a counter revolution. And uh, I don't know if you read the Sunday Independent or what you think of it as a publication, but you, you'll see very often their editorial writer are singing out the same hymn sheet. Yeah, they're all writing the same and thing. Jean, yeah. Will, Jean uh, Kerrigan, Kerrigan is kind of the lone voice in the wilderness on the back page. In any event, Liam Collins, who I think is the news editor there, wrote an article suggesting that I had um, met Willie O'Dea in a pub and he was giving me um, information off the record, and you could hear it in the tape uh, that there were glasses in the background. And, uh, and nothing could have been further from the truth. It was a Fianna Fáil local election launch to which I had been invited to interview the minister, and you couldn't get enough, uh, you know, an event more official than that. And he was saying, like, that, you know, that journalists have to earn the confidence of people, and often the information they get is in the pub, you know, for politicians or other sources, which there is a bit of truth to that. Uh, but I don't really make a habit of drinking with politicians myself, um, but you do have to earn their trust. But what you obviously have to do is appreciate the difference between on and off the record. Uh, but there were a couple of other articles that weekend by, you know, yeah. Jody Corcoran and people like that who were, you know, suggesting that, you know, what I hadn't done was Wasn't ethically correct. Um, and then, of course, the whole the whole thing with the Saudi of Energy at the time was the late English Fanning, and he actually did a two-page interview with Willie. And I just think uh, I read out the first um, question that Angus asked Willie on that day, just to illustrate, you know, what the Sunday Evening was up to on that day. Angus Fanning, right? First off, my commiserations. Not only are you one of the outstanding politicians in the country, you're one of the best across the board in all the parties. But if I may say so, you're a very fine journalist too. So, yeah, well, really, Angus, you know, really so that kind of, you know, army, yeah, yeah. So there were a lot of strands to it, you know. Uh, but you know, it was difficult for me, and I did come under a lot of pressure. There's people trying to fight me in pubs over it. And, uh, <laughs> you know. What, did you were the man who brought Willie O'Dea down? Yeah, and I still get that today. Hi, I'm Michael Wong from the Limerick Leader. And to, uh, aren't you the guy who... Uh, yeah, sorry, that's me. Like, and it still yeah. follows me around, you know. Yeah. And like, like it is, you know, is it a milestone for me? Yeah, but it's also a milestone because people do it's also a weary, to okay. my grave, you know. Yeah. But I suppose uh, the tape at least did add to the gaiety. Yeah. The nation for a while, and uh, we call it uh, the tape that launched a thousand skits. The tape that uh, launched a thousand skits. It was on okay. Gift Grove and oh, yes. Nomination, and I suppose I cannot claim to be the inspiration. 
for a rubber banded song. Um, <laughs> It's just called Sound for Willie O'Dea. Sound for Willie O'Dea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's on by you. Yeah. Shannon, the other guy. Willie, Willie O'Dea is uh, a donkey's look and is selling hash in Shannon because he lost his job. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's. Um, yeah. Well, very good. It, no, it's a very good insight into the whole thing. And as you said, like the ethics of it as well, um, you know, you were lucky you had the team. Mm. I mean, really, you were. Um, because it was the ultimate, I suppose, proof of the story. <coughs> 